You shouldn't have made that bet with your friends. Now, your spaceship is hovering just over the atmosphere of Jupiter, a gas giant and the largest planet in our solar system. You're staring at the ginormous pale yellow sphere in front of your eyes, dreading your task, which is to fly through the planet and leave on the other side. Doubts are plaguing your mind. Is it even possible? Well, you're about to find out. Jupiter is truly massive. If the planet was 80 times as massive as it is now, it would have a chance to turn into a tiny red dwarf star. But even though its size isn't enough for such a transformation, Jupiter is still huge, more than 89,000 miles wide at the equator. The planet is so large it could fit inside 1,300 Earths. It's also impressively hot, about 43,000 F at the core. If you decided to parachute into Jupiter, you would never land on a firm surface because the planet mostly consists of gas. Around 90% of the planet's atmosphere is hydrogen. The remaining 10% is made up of helium with tiny traces of other gases. The planet is also surrounded by a layer of thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds. They make Jupiter look colorful and beautifully striped. There's no solid ground on the planet. That's why astronomers define the planet's surface as the point where the atmospheric pressure equals that on Earth. You wouldn't be able to stand on that surface, though. It's just another layer of gases. But the gravitational pull there is around two and a half times more powerful than on our planet. The deeper you dive, the more difficult it gets to move. Under immense atmospheric pressure, hydrogen and helium gases turn into a dense fluid. Closer to the core, this liquid becomes a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium, which makes this region as exotic as the surface of the sun. Now, to imagine the gigantic pressure that exists near the center of Jupiter, think of the deepest place in Earth's oceans, the Mariana Trench. It's nearly seven miles deep, and pressures there reach more than 1,000 bars. For comparison, at sea level, you feel the pressure of approximately one bar. But that number doesn't seem all that impressive when you think about the pressure at the center of Jupiter. It reaches up to one million bars. So, if you tried to enter that region, your spacecraft wouldn't just get squished or melted. No, it would simply disintegrate into atoms. You won't even have time to say, oops. If you still decided to take the plunge, you'd have to go through different parts of the gas giant. First, you'd see wispy ammonia clouds. You might even enjoy a brief period of blue skies due to the same phenomenon of scattering of light that occurs on Earth. After that, you'd pass through some red-brown clouds. Those are made of ammonium hydrosulfide. And then you'd see intimidating towering clouds lit by constant lightning storms. Way deeper, between 4,350 and 8,700 miles down, your spacecraft would enter an atmosphere so hot that it would be glowing. This is where the temperature rises up to tens of thousands of degrees F, and the pressure rises to megabars. That's also where your spacecraft is likely to start to disintegrate. This is a mysterious region of Jupiter's interior we know little about. It's still unclear whether the planet's core is a molten ball of liquid or a solid rock more than a dozen times the mass of Earth. It's most likely the former. There's even some evidence the gas giant's core might be melting right at this moment. Scientists have suggested that it consists of a mixture of materials, including nitrogen, carbon, and even iron. In any case, not to risk your life, you'd better admit you've lost the bet and return to your hospitable home planet. How about a mysterious object that used to orbit between Mars and Jupiter? At one point in the early days of the solar system, it was destroyed by some catastrophic event. This space body is called Phaeton, and this planet is totally hypothetical. But some people believe that the debris the planet left behind could have formed the asteroid belt. If you like this kind of content, please give it a non-hypothetical like and subscribe. Your support is very important to us. Thank you. Now, at the start of the 19th century, people hadn't discovered the asteroid belt yet. But in 1801, one astronomer spotted the largest asteroid in our solar system, Ceres. At that time, it was believed that a planet was orbiting between Mars and Jupiter, and Ceres seemed to be a suitable candidate. But the next year, another astronomer discovered one more space object with a similar orbit. It was an asteroid that was later named Pallas. These discoveries made scientists conclude that these two objects could have been fragments of the very planet that had once been dwelling between Mars and Jupiter. 
The following discovery of two more asteroids, Juno and Vesta, seemed to confirm this idea. Only in the 20th century did the hypothetical planet get its name, Phaeton. It was actually a name taken from Greek mythology, meaning Shining One. The hero with this name was the son of the sun deity, Helios, who rode his solar chariot across the sky every day, giving humans the heat and light necessary for survival. One day, Helios allowed Phaeton to drive his chariot. But the sun didn't manage to control the horses. Everything went wrong, and Earth was about to burn down. That's why the main deity, Zeus, had to stop Phaeton with a thunderbolt. The idea of the asteroid belt being the sad result of the planet's destruction was called the disruption theory. And of course, there were several ideas explaining the planet's tragic fate. The most obvious one is that Phaeton was hit by a large space object. It could be another hypothetical body called Nemesis. Some people believe that it's our sun's companion star. According to this theory, the sun has a small companion star that has an extremely elliptical orbit. This orbit periodically brings it close to the Oort cloud, a large sphere of icy objects surrounding the sun. This, in turn, causes a lot of mess. It might be the reason why this hypothetical companion star was also nicknamed the Death Star. It might be a red or brown dwarf. But whatever it is at the furthest point of its orbit, it's believed to be about 1.5 light years away. The search for this star has been in progress for decades but no one has succeeded in locating this elusive and potentially non-existent space object. Anyway, back to Phaeton. Another theory claims that the planet could have suffered some internal cataclysm which tore it apart. But these days, the disruption theory has fallen out of favor. It was replaced by the accretion theory. According to it, the asteroid belt formed in the process of gradual buildup of particles initially floating in a gaseous environment. With time, they came together to create larger masses. Gravity pulled on these particles, encouraging them to stay together and form planetesimals, tiny planet-like bodies that later form real planets. Planetesimals kept colliding with one another, eventually developing into protoplanets. Such protoplanets grow until they form planetary bodies. As the mass of objects increases, the gravitational forces acting between particles become stronger too, continuing to build gas, dust, and ice within the nebular disk. It all has a snowball effect where the increase in mass results in more particles getting involved in the process. Eventually, there's no building material left, and large space objects float in the darkness of space. Now, many experts think that the asteroid belt is the remains of the protoplanetary disk which had once been orbiting the Sun before the planets formed. Unfortunately, it never had a chance to coalesce into a planet because Jupiter's gravitational effect prevented it from happening. In any case, even though Phaeton's was a good story, it's not popular anymore. When you explode planets, things get red hot. Atmospheres are pulled away. Stuff is flying apart. Everything collapses. The world becomes brighter than a dozen suns. You squeeze your eyes shut and cover your ears. Your hair stands on end. The sheer power of a cosmic blast is terrifying. But how can you do it? How can you blow up, let's say, Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system? Thick brown, yellow, red and white clouds hide its surface making the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. First of all, we shouldn't forget that the gas giant's powerful gravity is holding it together, which is the reason for the planet's spherical shape. And we would need to add a lot of energy to blow it apart. But here's the problem. If we used some explosive material for our goal, it wouldn't be very efficient. A lot of energy would get radiated as heat in the process. The mass of Jupiter equals 318 Earth's masses and about a thousandth of the mass of the Sun. The gas giant's diameter is also more than 11 times greater than that of Earth. It would be around a quarter of the distance from Earth to the Moon. So, can you imagine the enormous binding energy that keeps Jupiter together? Now, 
Experts claim that to explode this space giant, you'd need a pile of nuclear explosives as heavy as four moons. Can you imagine it? Or let's take another unit. A highly explosive material known as TNT. How much of it would you need to blow up Jupiter? The answer is 50 megatons. And one megaton is a million tons of TNT. These are some huge numbers. They also mean that if you made Jupiter out of TNT and blew it up, the explosion wouldn't produce enough energy to blow the planet itself apart. It would puff up. More. And more. But gravity would still manage to pull all the stuff Jupiter is made of back together. But let's suppose you somehow managed to find an enormous amount of explosives that would be enough to get rid of Jupiter. You hit the button, sitting in your spacecraft, hovering over the giant planet. Something is going on down there on Jupiter but it's unlike anything that would happen to a rocky planet. Instead of chunks of solid crust, you see jet streams of gas accelerating away from the planet's center. It's what used to be Jupiter's atmosphere, made up of hydrogen and helium gas. In no time, the matter hurtling away into space turns liquid. That's hydrogen in its different form. Under immense atmospheric pressure, this gas becomes liquid closer to the center of the planet. A bit later, you notice that the liquid becomes different again. Now, it's a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. And finally, something solid. It might be Jupiter's core, which is 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. The blast lasts no more than half a second. And still, the explosion is millions of times brighter than the sunshine. It's so powerful, it evaporates smaller planets like Mars and Earth. The sun remains pretty much untouched gets hotter and kind of unstable for a bit, but it doesn't last long. How would the disappearance of Jupiter affect our solar system? For one thing, this gas giant shepherds the asteroid belt, and without Jupiter out there, the belt might grow unstable. It would lead to an increase in the amount of debris invading the inner solar system. Plus, the gas giant also acts as a sponge, absorbing rogue chunks of rock, not letting them enter the inner solar system. So, it's great that Jupiter is practically indestructible, unless it collides with an object as huge as the Sun, of course. Or you could probably scoop the planet up a bit at a time. It would certainly take a while. One hypothetical project called a Jupiter Brain suggests taking Jupiter apart and turning it into a planet-sized supercomputer. And you know what? Some advanced technological civilization could probably do it, but not us humans yet. They aren't supposed to exist. No one expected to find them. Scientists can't explain how they formed. And still, the James Webb Space Telescope has found them. These six galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. They're so far away from us that they look like tiny reddish dots, even to this extremely powerful telescope. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from these galaxies and estimated their age. They appeared 500 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. So far, nothing surprising. Galaxies that young aren't exactly rare. Scientists think that our first star clusters could have sprung up soon after the universe left the so-called Dark Ages. Those were the first 400 million years of its existence. At that time, only a thick fog of hydrogen atoms filled the cosmos. What is extremely bizarre about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars inhabiting them. But this doesn't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. Plus, it doesn't match with earlier observations made by the Hubble Space Telescope. Wave's less powerful predecessor. So, according to scientists, what are early galaxies supposed to look like? The answer is simple, young and small. And indeed, previously, most early universe galaxies we found were just space babies, blue and small. They seem to have appeared out of the primordial cosmic soup just recently and were still building their early stars and other structures. Most young stars are actually blue, 
As they age, they acquire a reddish glow after burning through their star fuel and cooling down. That's why astronomers were not ready to see old red stars in those ancient galaxies Webb Telescope was built to discover. Another thing they weren't ready to spot was galaxies more massive than a billion suns, and still, it happened. The most massive galaxies discovered recently seem to have masses just twice or four times lower than that of the Milky Way. And the most astounding thing here is that these galaxies were already that big when the universe was a mere 3% of its current age. But before astronomers start rewriting their theories, trying to explain how such huge galaxies formed so fast after the Big Bang, we need to make sure that what we're looking at isn't some other space phenomenon. Even so, most alternative theories need totally new concepts as well. One of them goes like this. Perhaps stars in the early universe emit light in some unusual, exotic way. And since astronomers didn't know about it, they didn't include this possibility in their models. Or our understanding of how stars form might be inapplicable to the early universe. If any of these theories turns out to be true, it'll overturn our understanding of star formation altogether. Now, how about we talk about the device that helped astronomers to discover those bizarre galaxies? The James Webb Space Telescope is an absolutely stunning piece of equipment, which is around 100 times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. And the latter has observed places that are 13.4 billion light years away. The James Webb Telescope is also on the pricey side, to put it mildly. Even though originally the cost of the telescope was estimated to be just 1 to 3.5 billion, the whole development process cost around $10 billion. For comparison, it cost NASA $4.7 billion to build and launch the Hubble telescope. It was another $1.1 billion to fix it in orbit. Even though the James Webb Space Telescope itself is three stories high and the size of a tennis court, its mirrors are the lightest large telescope mirrors of all time. During the manufacturing process, they underwent a 92% reduction in weight. When you look at them, the telescope's mirrors seem to be gold. But in reality, they're made of beryllium. This is a steel gray, lightweight, and brittle metal. A gold coating is applied to each mirror, that's true. But they can't be produced entirely out of gold, since this precious metal tends to expand and contract even with small temperature changes. So, the total amount of gold in the James Webb Space Telescope is less than 2 ounces. That's a golf ball-sized piece of gold. And the gold plates covering the mirror are only 1,000 atoms thick. As for the telescope's abilities, it would be able to clearly see a US penny from 24 miles away and a football from 340 miles away. James Webb's telescope side is cooling itself down, and its temperature doesn't rise higher than negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit. That's cool enough to make liquid nitrogen. A truly enormous five-layered sunshield surrounds the telescope and reflects away as much sunlight as possible, letting the telescope stay cool. JWST is believed to be able to detect water on distant exoplanets. For a long time, astronomers have been discovering planets orbiting stars outside of the solar system by monitoring slight dips in stars' light. Such dips happen when planets pass in front of them. Plus, it's possible to read unique signatures in the light. This can tell us about a planet's chemical composition. And the strongest and most readable signatures happen within the infrared spectrum. And guess what? James Webb has state-of-the-art infrared instruments. They can help scientists spot new planets and even identify the presence of water there. The telescope was launched near the equator because Earth spins a bit faster there. And this gave the rocket some extra push. When the James Webb Space Telescope runs out of fuel, it'll keep orbiting the Sun indefinitely. On the other hand, 
Even though the telescope wasn't actually designed to be serviced or upgraded, it might potentially be refueled with the help of robots. This would extend its lifespan. Interestingly, at first, astronomers were sure that finding something exciting with the help of James Webb would take time. They thought that the first discovered galaxies would be so small and dim that the telescope would only find some remote candidates at best. But it didn't go as planned. As soon as the first images were released, scientists started finding countless galaxies, bright, large, and impressively old. The competition is still on. One research group after another spots new record-breaking worlds. One astronomer even said that the scientific world was freaking out since no one had actually expected such impressive results. One of the main goals of the Webb telescope is to observe the light from the very first stars and galaxies in the universe. Unfortunately, the farther away an object is, the faster it's moving away from us. And the longer the light has to travel, the more it stretches towards the infrared side of the spectrum. This is called redshifting in astronomy. But thanks to its infrared equipment, James Webb can reveal previously invisible worlds to us. So, thanks to this telescope, we've managed to see incredibly distant galaxies that were born around 3.8 billion years ago. It means that the light JWST detected took more than 13 billion years to reach Earth. Can you imagine that? But one of these galaxies stands out from the rest. It appears to be the oldest galaxy astronomers have discovered so far. It's called Glass Z13, and it dates back to a mere 300 million years after the Big Bang. The previous oldest galaxy scientists identified was found by the Hubble Space Telescope, and it dates back to 400 million years after the Big Bang. During that scarcely probed era, the very first galaxies and stars started to appear. But how exactly did this process unfold? No one knows for sure, yet. It might have depended on the laws of some exotic physics, including the influence of dark matter and dark energy or some poorly investigated communication between gas, dust, and starlight. With the help of the Webb telescope, scientists can now test their theories about what was happening out there after the birth of the universe. Picture a tiger. Tigers are known for their beautiful stripes, which they always keep the same. However, imagine if the tiger's stripes could change their size, position, and colors from time to time. Magical, right? But that's exactly what happens with one titan of our solar system, Jupiter. Why and how? Well, astronomers might just have the answer, so let's see. Jupiter is a huge and fascinating planet. When you're looking at its picture from far away, it's like seeing a beautiful sunrise. Here we have an entire palette, from creamy pale yellows to caramel browns, with even some blue shades. Jupiter is a fascinating place made mostly of hydrogen and helium, just like our sun. However, it didn't gather enough stuff during its formation to become a star. Instead, it became a colossal ball of gas that could fit more than 1,300 Earths inside. Jupiter has these interesting patterns of dark and light clouds that go around the planet in alternating bands like giant stripes. These dark stripes are called belts, and lighter ones are called zones. Actually, it's not unique in this. Earth and Jupiter both have these cool patterns in their atmospheres. It's just that Earth has a few of them, but Jupiter has a lot more. Why are these belts brown and beige? Those can be explained by the combination of hydrogen, helium, and other trace elements in the planet's atmosphere. It's like mixing different colors of paint to create new shades. These belts create beautiful patterns across the planet's surface. Now, because Jupiter has such a massive atmosphere and a weather system similar to Earth's, it experiences some extraordinary storms. So even though these stripes may look calm and peaceful, they're actually part of a wild weather system. It's like a never-ending storm party happening there. These belts and zones move in opposite directions around the planet. The belts go against Jupiter's rotation, like going against the flow, 
while the zones go with it, joining the dance. And not only do they move in different directions, but they also exist at different heights in the planet's atmosphere. The belts are like regions where things are rising up, like bubbles in a fizzy drink. So the cloud tops in the belts are higher up in the sky compared to the cloud tops in the zones, which are more like sinking areas. So, even though Earth and Jupiter have this similarity, their weather is completely different. It's like comparing apples and oranges. One of the most famous storms on Jupiter is the Great Red Spot. But why is it red? Well, that's a bit of a mystery. Scientists think that the storm sits at a higher altitude than the rest of the atmosphere. This means it gets a stronger dose of sunlight. Imagine standing on a hilltop where the sun shines brighter on you compared to the surroundings. In a similar way, the Great Red Spot gets more radiation from the sun. The storm also contains some special chemicals in its clouds, like ammonia and acetylene. When these chemicals receive that extra radiation, they react in a unique way, giving the storm its distinct red color. It's like a special effect in a cosmic theater. Anyway, the stripes look pretty cool and all. But what's the big mystery around them? Well, you see, one day scientists decided to look at data from deep inside Jupiter, about 30 miles below the surface. And after peeking in Jupiter's secrets, they noticed something strange. When they looked at Jupiter using a special type of light called infrared, the colors of its stripes actually switched around. The light bands that were pale and creamy in normal pictures become dark in the infrared view. The dark bands that were belts before now shined brightly in the infrared. This suggests something interesting. The belts on Jupiter have thinner cloud coverings compared to the zones. It's like the belts are wearing sheer see-through outfits while the zones have thicker clouds like fluffy jackets. So, what we see as dark bands in normal pictures turn out to be bright in the infrared, hinting that these belts have less cloud stuff blocking the light. But here's the most strange part. Every few years, something changes. It's like the weather on Jupiter goes through a wild roller coaster ride. The colors of the belts can change, and sometimes the whole weather pattern becomes a bit crazy for a while. Scientists have been scratching their heads, trying to figure out why this happens. So they've decided to use a special spacecraft called Juno to investigate this. Since 2016, Juno has been gathering a lot of information about Jupiter like a spy collecting clues. One of the things Juno has been looking at is Jupiter's magnetic field. Just like Earth, Jupiter has a magnetic field. It's like an invisible bubble that surrounds the planet, extending to space. This magnetic field is really important because it protects the planet and everything on it. It acts like a shield against harmful particles from space, like those coming from the sun. But Jupiter's way bigger than us so his protective shield is much stronger. Magnetic fields are generated by something called a dynamo, which is like a big swirling conducting fluid inside the planet. This fluid moves around and rotates, kind of like a dance party happening deep within the planet. So scientists have been looking at the data collected by Juno over the years and noticed something interesting. Jupiter's magnetic field has its own little motions, kind of like when you see waves in the ocean. Scientists call these motions torsional oscillations, which is just a fancy way of saying wave-like movements. It's like Jupiter is doing its own magnetic dance. Now let's imagine that Jupiter's insides are like a giant pot of boiling soup. Deep within Jupiter, there are slow currents that carry heat upwards, just like a conveyor belt. This heat eventually reaches the upper part where we see the clouds. But here's where things get interesting. Imagine someone starts stirring the soup really fast with a spoon. Those wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, act just like that spoon. They create a disturbance that messes up the slow currents. Now this disruption has a big impact on Jupiter's weather. It's like turning up the heat in the kitchen and changing the way the soup cooks. The patterns of rising and sinking in the clouds, which we call upwelling and downwelling, get all mixed up a whirlwind in the soup. Our clever scientists also noticed something special near Jupiter's equator. They discovered a concentrated spot of magnetism called the Great Blue Spot. And guess what? This spot is slowing down, like it's taking a break from its usual fast movement. This suggests that a new type of wavy motion, a new dance, is about to begin. 
So to sum it all up, the scientists have come up with a cool idea. These wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, disrupt the slow currents inside Jupiter, messing up the cloud patterns and causing wild weather. And when the scientists calculated the time it takes for these wave-like motions to happen, they discovered that they match the same time periods when the stripes on Jupiter change. So, in simple terms, the scientists think that these wave-like movements in Jupiter's magnetic field are causing the changes in the stripes on the planet. Pieces of a puzzle are coming together. Scientists are still trying to fully understand why this happens, but it's an exciting step forward in unraveling the mysteries of our vast universe. But there are still some mysteries left to solve. To find more answers, scientists need to keep watching Jupiter closely in the future. By observing how the clouds change, they can check if their theory is correct or if it needs some adjustments. From its massive storms to its colorful belts, Jupiter never fails to amaze us with its cosmic wonders. It may not have ignited as a star, but it shines brightly as a gas giant, captivating us with its size and beauty. So keep your curiosity alive and always reach for the stars. You're standing in a room full of explosive gas. One spark could cause an explosion so powerful that all the windows and doors would be just blown out with a huge column of fire. And you're holding a match. You need a bigger target than this room. How about the largest room of explosive gas in our entire solar system? Meet Jupiter. It's the fifth planet from the Sun and the largest one in our system. It's 11 times the width of Earth and almost two and a half times heavier than all the other planets in our solar system combined. If we put Jupiter on the scales, we would need about 317 Earths to balance it. But most importantly, it has a lot of methane in its atmosphere. It's the gas we use in our kitchen or fill up our car with, and it burns just fine. More importantly, there's metallic hydrogen. In its normal state, hydrogen is the lightest element in the universe. But on Jupiter, it's at great pressure, more than 400 million atmospheres. By comparison, on Earth, you feel the pressure of one atmosphere. So multiply that by 400 million, and hydrogen is compressed so much that it looks like liquid metal. Metallic hydrogen can be a great fuel. It'll give off 20 times more energy than burning ordinary hydrogen. So you and your match can have great fun out there. Okay, here we go. The first problem is distance. Jupiter is only one planet away from us, but the path is also blocked by the asteroid belt behind Mars. It's full of giant rock debris. On average, each asteroid could be as wide as the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. There's rocks the size of an entire state. And the biggest asteroid of them all is Ceres. It's almost as wide as Alaska. It's even considered a dwarf planet. And this dangerous journey to Jupiter takes about 650 days. That's almost two years of boredom inside a spaceship. By comparison, the longest time astronauts have spent aboard a spaceship is 84 days. But we'll let you take your favorite DVD collection and a couple bags of popcorn. At the end of the day, you'll be able to get some sleep after a hard day at work. Fast forward two years into the future, and you've arrived at your destination. You're already imagining lighting a match at the surface of Jupiter, exploding it like a balloon. Oh, be careful when you get close to it. Because of Jupiter's great weight, it has a strong gravitational force, about three times stronger than back home on Earth. The closer you get to its surface, the weaker you feel and you can even barely stand on your feet. The maximum weight you can lift here is also three times less, and even a match you're holding in your hand already feels heavier. If you try to jump up, you need more effort. Actually, you can't even do that because Jupiter is a gas giant. That means it has no solid surface. Theoretically, the deeper you dive into these clouds, the more pressure you'll feel. Gradually, the clouds and gases thicken and form a kind of liquid. But you don't have to dive that deep. Methane is a light gas, and it's closer to the surface. So, this is the moment of truth. You take a match, you flick it on the box, and nothing happens. Well, let's give it a couple more tries. Second match. Third. Ugh, nothing works. Okay, you've got a gas burner in your backpack. You unscrew the valve to maximum and 
nothing happens again. Well, that's because it takes three components to start the combustion process. The first is fuel. Luckily, there's enough methane and metallic hydrogen on Jupiter to blow up the whole planet in a matter of seconds. The second component is the ignition source. It's the initial force that will start the combustion process. It could be a spark, an electrical discharge, or a match like the one you have in your hand. And the last ingredient is oxygen. Yes, the same oxygen that we breathe. It's just as important to fire as the fuel itself. For an experiment, try lighting a small candle. Now cover it with a glass. You see how the fire keeps burning for a few seconds and then goes out? The fuel is still there, but the fire has used up all the oxygen inside the glass, and the burning process is over. The same thing happens on Jupiter. There just can't be fire, simply because there's no oxygen. And you didn't even have to fly there to find that out. From Earth, we can see hundreds of thousands of little meteorites falling on Jupiter. The asteroid belt next to it is to blame for this. When they hit its atmosphere, they start to burn. And that doesn't instantly blow up the entire planet. But don't be upset. There's still a way to ignite this gas giant planet. All you have to do is trigger a thermonuclear chain reaction on the planet. Then, there'll be an explosion so powerful, it'll be visible from Earth. And it will be like the birth of a new star. To do that, we need to detonate a nuclear reactor, like the ones that give us electricity here on Earth. In fact, we'd have to send everything we have to Jupiter. But even that won't do the trick. Big asteroids, when they hit the planet, cause a much bigger explosion. In 2009, a meteorite the size of five soccer fields hit Jupiter. It caused an explosion of five billion tons of TNT. This incident left a dark spot the size of the Pacific Ocean. And an even bigger explosion happened there in 1994. After that collision, there was a giant spot on Jupiter almost the size of our planet. But strong winds and storms quickly began to sweep away the traces of the explosion. After a few weeks, Jupiter looked like normal. The problem is that our attempts to blow up the gas giant took place on the planet's surface. We need to plant a charge the size of the moon deep below. A massive explosion will cause a thermonuclear reaction and cause the metallic hydrogen to detonate. The explosive process is set, and within seconds, Jupiter explodes like a giant balloon. But this spectacle will be the last one that humanity ever sees. The explosion would disturb the stable orbits of Earth and the other planets. The trajectory of Earth around the Sun might change, and we may see the dawn not in the east, but on any other side of the world. When the strong wind from the explosion reaches the Earth, it'll start scraping our atmosphere. Soon, our planet will lose its ozone layer. It was our shield that protected us from solar radiation. In such a situation, we'll have to hide underground for the rest of our lives. But even this can't protect us. Before long, the Earth will be showered with thousands of meteorites. Jupiter was so heavy that it held the asteroid belt in place. Without it, the asteroids would start flying towards us. Earth would feel a constant meteor shower. But there would be no one left on Earth to observe it anymore. Jupiter's explosion can be compared to a supernova. In fact, Jupiter is practically a star. If it were just a little bigger and heavier, it would start to shrink. The intense pressure on the planet's core would start thermonuclear reactions. Eventually, Jupiter will have turned into a brown dwarf. And it would be 50 times heavier than it is now. But because it doesn't have enough weight to do that, Jupiter is sometimes called a failed star. Well, maybe we should visit other gas planets in our solar system and try to light our match there. Saturn. Saturn's atmosphere is similar to Jupiter, but there's no oxygen for combustion there either. So all you have to do is admire the planet's beautiful rings and move on. Well, Uranus and Neptune are much smaller, and they don't have metallic hydrogen, so their explosion wouldn't be as strong. But you still wouldn't be able to ignite them with a match, because there's no atmosphere full of oxygen. But there is one planet where you could light a fire with your match, it's GJ1132b, and it's 39 light years away. Scientists think it might have oxygen on it, although it's not a gas giant that has combustible gases in its atmosphere. 
but you can still sit on its rocky ground and make a fire to admire the unusual sunset. Now imagine a place where a single day lasts longer than a whole year. On Venus, a day, meaning one full spin on its axis, is as long as 243 Earth days. And what's even weirder, despite the fact that Venus is experiencing a never-ending day, it has a shorter year than Earth. While Earth takes about 365 days to complete one orbit around the Sun, Venus does it in just 225 days. So, somehow, for Venus, a day is more epic than a whole year. Venus is a strange planet in general. It's called Earth's twin because of how alike we are, although it's a bit smaller than Earth. But there are some drastic differences, too. For example, it spins in the opposite direction, which means the sun there rises in the west and sets in the east. And Venus isn't the only one who dances to its own rhythm. Uranus does that, too. And finally, Venus is quite crazy in terms of its atmosphere. When you stand on Earth, you don't really feel the weight of the air around you. Well, on Venus, that feeling would be like having an elephant sitting on your shoulders. Venus has 90 times the atmospheric pressure of Earth. The atmosphere there is a thick layer of toxic gases. For example, carbon dioxide that's released by all the volcanoes. It presses down with incredible force. This results in very hot temperatures. No wonder it'll take a long time before we'll be able to stand on this planet. Meanwhile, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, has an even more speedy orbit than Venus. It completes a full journey around the Sun in just about 88 Earth days. However, it has a slow spin on its axis, which means that one day on Mercury takes about 176 Earth days, basically half a year. Just like with Venus, a day there takes much longer than a year. Since it's closest to the Sun, no wonder Mercury experiences some super-extreme temperature swings. Daytime temperatures can soar up to a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. But wait for the sunset. At night, it drops to freezing minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh. That's because Mercury doesn't have a thick atmosphere like we do, so the heat doesn't distribute across the planet evenly. If one side is in the dark, it'll be super cold, and the other side will be scorching hot, just like if you let a regular big rock lie down under the sun for a while. In fact, it's so cold that there might even be some ice on it. Look at the planet's north polar region especially those sunlit yellow spots inside craters. These are indications of water ice. Turns out, water is much more common in space than we thought. Mars is often dubbed the Red Planet. It earns this nickname from the abundance of iron oxide, or rust, covering its surface. The iron-rich minerals create a rusty red hue that paints the Martian landscape. But it turns out, Mars isn't just red. If you were standing on Mars, you'd witness desert-like butterscotch terrain with caramel and golden glows, some brown, and even a glimpse of a slight greenish hue. Mars also has the biggest mountain in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons, standing at a staggering height of about 13.6 miles tall. It's even taller than Mount Everest. It was formed by the volcanic eruption yielding low-viscosity lava, creating a shield-like structure. Since Mars is covered in sand, it's also famous for its crazy dust storms. But it turns out they're even more insane than we thought. These storms can last for months. While they might present challenges for future human missions, they also contribute to the planet's mesmerizing appearance when observed from afar. And not only storms, but even its own Mars quakes. Also known as seismic tremors, they were first detected by NASA in 2019. Unlike earthquakes that are often triggered by tectonic plate movements, Martian quakes are thought to result from the cooling and contracting of the planet's interior. It's interesting how similar, yet how different the planets are. Saturn's iconic rings might hold a secret link to Earth's ancient past. The rings are composed mainly of ice particles and debris and are estimated to be relatively young in space terms, perhaps just a few hundred million years old. Now, there are some theories that propose that they were born after some catastrophic event. For example, the collision of two large moons or the breakup of a comet. What's interesting is that this timeline coincides with the age of the dinosaurs' demise on Earth. Could there be a connection? <laughs> Who knows? 
By the way, while Saturn takes the crown for its rings, it's not the only planet in our solar system sporting them. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have their own set of rings, although they might not be as visible and cool as Saturn's. However, there's something where Saturn truly stands out – the magnificent hexagon at its north pole. It's a colossal six-sided figure. Each side of this incredible structure measures around 9,000 miles long, which is 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. Scientists aren't sure how it was formed or why. They think it might be due to varying wind speeds. Or maybe it's shaped by a localized, slow, meandering jet stream. So far, it remains another of Saturn's mysteries. Much like Saturn's hexagon, Jupiter also has its own weird spot. It's called the Great Red Spot. This is a storm that's been raging for at least 350 years and is larger than Earth itself. Despite its name, the spot's coloration has varied over the years, ranging from brick red to pale salmon. Scientists continue to study this enduring storm, unlocking the mysteries of its persistence and ever-changing hues. Meteorologically, the Great Red Spot is a powerhouse. It generates enormous pressure in Jupiter's southern hemisphere. Meanwhile, Jupiter itself is a powerhouse when it comes to magnetic fields. Its magnetic influence is colossal. It extends far beyond the planet itself and creates one of the largest and strongest magnetic fields in our solar system. Because of that, Jupiter is a source of intense radiation and mesmerizing auroras. While Earth's northern lights are breathtaking, Jupiter has something to offer too. The magnetic field interacts with charged particles from Jupiter's moons and the solar wind. This creates visually striking auroras near its poles. But compared to Earth, the scale of these auroras is incredible, like nothing we've seen on our planet. But even having a cool big spot isn't a unique feature in our solar system. A stormy giant Neptune, the eighth and farthest planet from the Sun, also has its great dark spot. Just like Jupiter, it's a massive vortex in Neptune's atmosphere. But unlike its Jupiter counterpart, this spot tends to come and go because of Neptune's dynamic and ever-changing weather patterns. Neptune, together with Uranus, is known as an ice giant. And just like other giants, it boasts some of the most ferocious winds in our solar system. Its supersonic winds can get faster than 2,200 miles per hour. What a drama queen! But this explains its thick cloud formations. By the way, if you ever dreamed of a planet raining diamonds, you might want to visit this planet. Deep within Neptune's atmosphere, where pressures are extreme, scientists theorize that carbon atoms are compressed and form diamonds. And then, these diamonds might be raining down. What a unique touch to stormy weather! Neptune's moons got from their parent with the weird weather. For example, its largest moon, Triton, has a touch of cryovolcanism. Instead of spewing molten rock like Earth's volcanoes, Triton's cryovolcanoes erupt with a mix of water, ammonia, and nitrogen. Picture it as icy geysers shooting material into space. Seems like in our solar system alone, each planet has its own quirks and interesting qualities. Let's hope that we discover some more interesting things in outer space in the future. Hey Mythbusters, today we're debunking some classic space myths. Hop on the next space shuttle and let's get to the bottom of these tales once and for all. Picture this, you're floating weightlessly in space, sipping on a cup of delicious hot chocolate, when a peculiar thought pops into your head. Can you scream in outer space? And if yes, would anyone hear that scream? answer to this one. You can't hear sounds in outer space. It's not that sounds don't exist. It's just that you can't hear them. There's no one better to clarify this myth than Chris Hadfield. He's been on a couple of spacewalks during his life as an astronaut. And once you're out there in the darkness of space, you can't hear anything. All you hear is silence. Complete silence. But hey, just around the corner is a massive ball of explosion, aka the sun. We just can't hear the explosions happening because there's no medium for sound to travel through. It would be quite uncomfortable for an astronaut though if they could hear all the noises going on in outer space. 
Now, imagine you're zipping through space, feeling like a futuristic superhero, when a shooting star passes by your side. But wait, is it really a star? Unfortunately, shooting stars are not stars at all. They are small space rocks known as meteoroids, entering Earth's atmosphere and creating a stunning light show. Oh, and since we're debunking myths, let's head straight for another one. You've probably heard that meteors only crash into Earth on extremely rare occasions, like once every dinosaur extinguishing apocalypse. That's not true. Scientists estimate that about 48 tons of meteoritic material fall on Earth each day. But almost all of this material is vaporized in Earth's atmosphere. The bright trail we see in the night sky is what we popularly call a shooting star. Next time you make a wish upon a shooting star, remember, you're actually hoping on a tiny piece of space debris. It's not so romantic after all. Can we or can we not fly into the stratosphere on air balloons? Apparently, we can. The Earth's stratosphere starts relatively close to the ground, about 7 or 8 miles up from the Earth's surface, but it continues a long way up. If you were to fly yourself all the way into the stratosphere with some type of air balloon, just make sure you have really good equipment at hand. You'll need a special suit and some breathing devices because air starts to get pretty thin the higher you get. Of course, if you do go all the way up, you need to get a picture of the Earth's curvature. So take a chest harness with you where you can put a special camera or something like that. And how about you live stream the whole thing? That would be a first! Imagine it's been 102 days since you left Earth. You've adapted well to life in outer space, but something weird is happening to your body. You're getting taller. How is that even possible? Don't stress about it, it's completely normal. The truth of the matter is, you're not getting taller. This is what happens to your body when it's not under the effect of gravity. Our body has natural space between vertebrae and joints. On Earth, this space is almost completely squeezed due to the force of gravity. But in space, your body gets some time off of the pushing force of gravity and begins to stretch more and more. So yes, astronauts can grow up to 3% taller when they're on long missions. And here's a curiosity, NASA has that all covered when they're tailor-making spacesuits, of course. This way, astronauts will always have extra space in their suits. Once astronauts are back on Earth, the anti-gravity effect will wear off. So maybe they'll spend a few days wearing capri pants before it fits perfectly on their bodies again. Never have I ever pictured an airplane door bursting open mid-flight and a bunch of passengers being sucked into the atmosphere like flying feathers. Well, I'm betting most of you have had similar thoughts when getting inside a plane. Now imagine if this were to happen in outer space. Common knowledge says that if an astronaut is sucked out of an airlock, this person would be burnt to a crisp. Brace yourselves, because this is not only true, but the reality of it is way worse. According to astronaut Chris Hadfield, this is what would happen. The part of your body in the shade of the sun would experience temperatures of negative 418 degrees Fahrenheit, while the part of you getting sunlight would burn at around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Your lungs would collapse and your blood would start to boil like tea water. So you would burn, freeze, lose your ability to breathe and boil. Yikes! How many times have you heard that astronauts have to work out every second of every day, otherwise they'll pass out? This is a complete myth. Remember we talked about gravity earlier? Due to the lack of gravity in outer space, our bodies don't have to do any heavy work. Our torsos don't have to sustain the weight of our heads. And we don't have to make any effort to move our legs because, essentially, there's no walking in outer space. Now imagine living like that for six months, or even a year of your life. Your muscles could turn into jello. That's why astronauts work out. They'll strap themselves and run on a treadmill, or they'll do some weightlifting in a special machine. This way their muscles won't feel the lack of gravity too much. They do need to keep hydrated though. You know what? If I was an astronaut, I'd ask NASA if I could take my super soft water flask up into space with me. You've probably heard that space smells like burnt steak. 
or barbecue sauce. Now, as much as this sounds absurd, this myth is more true than it is false. Astronauts obviously can't smell space when they're in it because they can't take off their helmets. They usually smell it once a space vehicle docks and they open up a hatch. Apparently, what causes this smell is the presence of hydrocarbons that float around in space. Who would have thought, huh? Hey, smart people, let me ask you a question. Do you really think that if astronauts fly at the speed of light, they won't age a single second? I knew you'd say no. Let's get a few things straight. First of all, we haven't figured out how to operate vehicles at the speed of light. This would require an immense amount of energy, and we don't have the technology to do that. Second, even if we managed to send a human inside a spacecraft that traveled at the speed of light, this person would still age. They would age differently than the people who remained on Earth, that's a fact, but they would still age. Do you lot really think there's such a thing as immortality? Nah. If you've seen the first Avatar, then you certainly remember that humans only managed to get to Pandora because they traveled in cryosleep. In other words, they froze their bodies, put them in a cryo bed, and traveled for years without aging. Yes, this sounds amazing, but we still don't have the technology to do that. Our bodies are mainly made out of water, right? And when you freeze water, it expands. That's why you should never leave soda cans unattended in your freezer. Right now, if we froze a person's body, the water inside of it would expand, harming tissues and organs. So no, we can't cryosleep our way into interstellar travel. Not yet, at least. Here's a crazy thought. What would happen if an astronaut took a drone with him on one of their spacewalks? Unless it's a NASA-designed drone, maybe the thing would freeze and burn like humans would if they went into space without a suit. But hey, a person can dream, can't they? Earth's magnetic field hides a fascinating story. It turns out that it's getting weaker day by day. In fact, it's been doing so for the last 3,000 years. And if this trend continues, we could be in for some trouble within a millennium. What's the big deal? Well, picture this. Magnetic north becomes south, and vice versa. Pretty wild, right? When this happens, our planet's protective magnetic shield might weaken, allowing more cosmic rays to hit us. These high-energy particles from the universe can cause electronic malfunctions in our satellites and produce elements that could be harmful to us. The last time a polarity reversal occurred was between 772,000 and 774,000 years ago. Thankfully, humanity has some pretty smart people on the case who are investigating the history of Earth's magnetic field. They take cores of sediments from the seafloor and study the magnetization of fossils to figure out when these reversals occurred in the past and when they might happen again. Another group of researchers is studying the South Atlantic Anomaly, SAA, a vast region of Earth's magnetic field that is about three times weaker than the field at the poles. Using data from multiple satellites, they are trying to figure out what's causing the SAA and how it might change in the future. This could give us a glimpse into how a weakened magnetic field can affect our satellites and our planet. Sure, our generation won't be here to witness these changes, but it does make you wonder what that planet might look like upside down. Magnetically, that is. NASA's astronomers have also announced that in 4 billion years, the Milky Way galaxy is going to get a major glow-up. After a cosmic collision that will shake things up, I'm not talking about a small fender bender here, I'm talking about a titanic collision with our neighboring Andromeda galaxy. Humanity will have to hold on to its space helmet for this one, because the sun might get flung into a new region of the galaxy. However, our Earth and solar system probably won't be seriously affected. Sounds difficult to believe, so how come? NASA's Hubble Space Telescope did some hardcore measurements of Andromeda's motion. Although the galaxies will plow into each other, the stars inside each galaxy are so far apart that they won't collide with other stars during the encounter. 
However, the stars will be thrown into different orbits around their new galactic centers. According to simulations, our solar system will probably be tossed much farther from the galactic core than it is today. Set your telescopes aside, you don't need to start counting down the years. This event is likely scheduled in about 4 billion years, so chances for us to witness it are zero. Saturn is losing its rings. Thankfully, we won't be here to witness this sad event either. Apparently, the rings are being pulled into Saturn as a dusty rain of ice particles, all under the influence of Saturn's magnetic field. According to NASA's research, the ring rain is draining an amount of water products that could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool from Saturn's rings every half an hour. The entire ring system will likely be gone in 300 million years. Scientists believe we should consider ourselves lucky to witness Saturn's ring system at all, as it seems to be in the middle of its lifetime. But if you think about it that way, that rings around planets are all temporary, there's a chance we've just missed out on the giant ring system of Jupiter, or those of Uranus and Neptune. These planets have only thin ringlets around them these days. Scientists have long debated whether Saturn was formed together with its rings or if the planet acquired them later in life. The new research favors the second scenario, indicating that they are unlikely to be older than 100 million years, while Saturn itself is around 4.5 billion years old. What caused the rings to appear in the first place? Well, there are a few theories. One of them suggests the rings could have formed when small, icy moons in orbit around Saturn collided. Perhaps their own orbits were messed up by a gravitational tug from a passing asteroid or comet. Who knows what humans might end up looking like in the future? It's unlikely we'll see any major changes in our lifetime. But let's take a journey to the future and ponder what we might evolve into. Will we become cyborgs with all sorts of cool machine implants? Or maybe we'll become a hybrid species of biological and artificial beings. To understand our future evolution, we gotta take a peek at our past. A million years ago, Homo sapiens didn't even exist. There were a few other similar species though, like the Neanderthal. Fast forward to today, and humans have become taller and sturdier. Maybe in the future we'll become smaller to conserve energy as it's predicted that our planet will get more crowded. Speaking of crowded planets, living in these new conditions means we have to adapt and fast. We're constantly interacting with lots of people and remembering names is becoming a crucial skill. Luckily, technology might help us out with brain implants that will improve our memory. In the future, we might also have more noticeable technologies as part of our appearance. Imagine having an artificial eye with a camera that can read different frequencies of light. While predicting a million years into the future is pure speculation, we can use bioinformatics to make some predictions about the immediate future. Demographic trends suggest that urban areas will become more genetically diverse, while rural areas will become less diverse. And what about space? If we end up colonizing Mars, our bodies could change due to lower gravity. Maybe we'll have longer arms and legs, or even insulating body hair like our Neanderthal cousins. In the future, our moon is also going to witness some dramatic changes. We'll miss these ones too. In about 5 billion years, things are going to get really interesting in this corner of the universe. For now, the sun is chilling in its main sequence phase, just burning hydrogen like nobody's business. In the future, during the red giant phase, the sun is going to puff up like a balloon until its atmosphere reaches out and engulfs our beloved Earth and Moon. Our natural satellite, which is already moving away from Earth, is going to get warped around the sun's influence. Its orbit will get all wonky, and it'll end up closer to Earth during the new moon phase than during the full moon. And that's not even the worst part. If left alone, the moon would keep on moving away from Earth until it'll need almost 50 days to orbit us. 
As the sun continues with its own journey, its atmosphere will drag on the moon and cause its orbit to decay. Eventually, the moon will get torn apart into a stunning ring of debris circling Earth. We're talking about all its mountains, craters, and even the footprints and flags we left there, all scattered throughout the debris field. There's a chance the sun will shed enough mass to spare Earth and the moon from total annihilation. Or if we're really lucky, the sun will lose 20% of its mass and we'll be safe and sound. It's all just theory right now, we haven't seen a red giant star during this phase. The universe itself might go completely dark one day too. Scientists can't predict it with absolute certainty, but they can make some educated guesses. Right now, our universe is 13.77 billion years old, and it's still churning out new stars left and right. It's said that eventually, after about 1 trillion years, the last star will be born. That final star will be a little guy, a red dwarf, just a fraction the size of our sun. These stars are champs at living long lives, slowly sipping on hydrogen to keep their fusion reactions going. But even they can't last forever. Fast forward about 100 trillion years and the last light will go out. The universe will be dark and lonely, but thankfully we won't be here to watch it all fade away. You get the last instructions from the team and get into your spaceship. It's the first spacecraft made on Earth that can move at a speed close to the speed of light. Your task is to visit the most unusual and terrifying places in space and send scientists detailed information about them. And so, your journey begins. Your spacecraft is accelerating, and you dash past the moon. In the distance, you see a small reddish planet. It's Mars. And look at that spectacular giant surrounded by a set of rings. That's Saturn! You wish you could have more time to explore this gas giant, but you have to hurry. You pass by beautiful stars. Some of them are luminous, others have a reddish hue, and some seem to be dimming. That's Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky on Earth. It's about 8.6 light years away from us, but you're traveling fast, and soon you see Polaris, aka the North Star, which is way further, 431 light years away. Sometimes you manage to spot tiny dots circling these stars. Those are planets. And then, suddenly, you see nothing. At first, you're horrified. Something has gone wrong, and you've accidentally entered a black hole? Has your equipment malfunctioned? Because it seems that at a distance of 700 million light years away from Earth, there's a hole. A blank void with no galaxies, stars, planets, or asteroids. You can't see anything. The void is a roughly spherical region of about 330 million light years across. Our home Milky Way galaxy could fit in there billions of times over. And then it dawns on you. What you're looking at is the mysterious Boats Void. It lies about 700 million light years away from Earth in the constellation of Boats, the herdsman driving the plow around the North Pole. At first, this void was called the Great Nothing, but later it was given its current name. Now we know that galaxies look like a giant web. Most of them are parts of long structures called filaments. Those wind through the cosmos, and when they meet, they form regions with a high concentration of galaxies. These regions are what we know as galaxy clusters, but between these clusters and threads, there are ginormous empty voids that hardly contain any galaxies. Such voids actually make up almost 80% of the observable universe, and most of them are huge from 30 to 300 million light years wide. The Boats Void is one of the most massive ones. It's even earned the title of Super Void. Astronomers think it might be the result of a few smaller voids merging together. But what could have caused such giant empty areas to appear in the first place? The reason might lie in the origin of the universe. In its early days, all the matter in the universe was packed together quite tightly. Astronomers even think it was something like a uniform soup. 
But pretty soon, random quantum fluctuations started distributing this matter. Some areas became denser. As a result, their gravitational pull became stronger and they began stealing matter from less dense regions. This made such areas even denser and they kept attracting more and more matter. At the same time, smaller clumps of matter started drifting further away from the center, forming galaxies. After staring at nothingness for some time, you decide to explore other space objects and start the engine of your spacecraft again. There's one kind of space formation you've been looking forward to seeing. Nebulas. Those are gigantic clouds of gas and dust. With time, gravity starts to pull these clumps of dust and gas together. They grow larger and larger, and their gravity gets more powerful. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? One day, this mass becomes so big that it collapses under its own gravity and forms new stars. So, you decide to visit some of the most beautiful nebulas out there. And you start with the Butterfly Nebula. This butterfly's wingspan is more than three light years. And the structure inside the nebula is one of the most complicated ever observed. The central star, a white dwarf, is heated to an incredible 450,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It means it was formed from a gargantuan star, likely more than five times the size of our sun. The white dwarf is surrounded by a thick disk of dust and gas at the equator. That's what probably makes the whole structure look like an hourglass or a butterfly. The next place you decide to visit is the Eskimo Nebula, 5,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Gemini. It was discovered more than 200 years ago and got its name for a reason. Its double shell formation looks like a person's face hidden in a padded hood of a winter jacket. But in reality, this parka is a disk of material with a ring of comet-shaped objects. And the tails of these objects stream away from the star at the center of the Eskimo Nebula. The bizarre orange streaks in the outer part of the cloud stretch light years away in all directions. As for the Eskimo's face, even though it resembles a ball of twine, in reality, it's a bubble of material blown into space by the wind of high-speed material produced by the central star. Your next destination is the Ring Nebula. At first sight, it's a giant cloud of dust and gas surrounding an old, almost extinguished star, which does look like a ring. But astronomers say the nebula isn't a bagel, it's a jelly-filled donut. The deep space colorful object more than 2,000 light years away from Earth is actually a ring that wraps around a blue, ball-shaped structure. Each end of the structure sticks out of the ring's opposite sides. Now you can head to a place called the Pillars of Creation. You find it more than 7,000 light years away from Earth in the Eagle Nebula. That's a young cluster of stars just 5.5 million years old, space babies. Once, the Hubble Space Telescope managed to take an image of several dark silhouettes near the nebula center. And now you can see them with your own eyes. Those are the so-called Pillars of Creation, an active star-forming region. And since you've already visited a star-forming region, why don't you drop by a living fossil galaxy? For example, DG Sat 1. It's as big as the Milky Way but it's nearly invisible because its stars are spread out incredibly thinly. But what makes the galaxy so unique is that it's sitting all alone, unlike other galaxies of this kind, which are usually found in clusters. It can mean that DG Sat 1 was formed in a different era, probably a mere 1 billion years after the Big Bang. If it's true, the galaxy is a real living fossil. The next stop on your space sightseeing tour is the Black Widow Pulsar. Just like its spider namesake, this rotating neutron star is munching on its partner, a lightweight brown dwarf star. The more material the pulsar consumes, the more slowly it spins. The energy the neutron star is losing in the process causes the companion star to dwindle. Oh, look at this! That's a stellar nursery in the constellation of Centaurus. 
But even though this place might be called nursery, it's anything but peaceful or safe. This region, made up of hydrogen and newborn stars, is located in a nebula in the constellation of Centaurus, around 6,500 light years away from Earth. The intense energy these baby stars emit makes hydrogen clouds glow ominous red. This energy is so powerful that it's eating away dark clouds of dust and they're disappearing like lumps of butter on a hot frying pan. You're continuing your journey when you see something absolutely amazing, a cloud of water floating in space. To be more precise, it's a cloud of water vapor surrounding a supermassive black hole 12 billion light years away from Earth. The cloud contains 140 trillion times the entire volume of water on our planet. Astronomers believe this water cloud appeared just 1.6 billion years later than the universe itself.